What's shaking, book two? My name's Cam, and what? Wait, wait. <clears throat> oh yeah, much more seventies. Welcome to another video. Today we're talking about sex. Mm. We're talking about drugs. Mm. We're talking about rock and roll. Mm. Fuck. Specifically today, I'm talking about Daisy Fleetwood and the Mac. Fleetwood Jones and the Six Max. Daisy Jones and the Six. That makes a lot more sense. Look, I'm, I'm sure it's not lost on anyone that this story is heavily inspired by Fleetwood Mac. More specifically, probably the story of Stevie Nicks herself. I feel like it's also at least slightly inspired by the drama that went on with the Eagles when they were coming up. And you know what? Probably a whole lot of other 60s and 70s bands as well. It's not really a big issue that it draws inspiration from those bands. I don't really have a problem with that per se. It just did feel very similar at a lot of points to the story of Fleetwood Mac. Specifically like a fantastic and world-class album coming out, not just in spite of a lot of uh, emotional drama within the band behind the scenes. Not just in spite of that, but rather because of that. Because of that, we ended up with Rumors by Fleetwood Mac. And in Daisy Jones and the Six, that album is Aurora. I, okay, alright, I guess, I guess I can't really use a Fleetwood Mac clip. One thing I know a lot of people didn't like, but I want to clear up straight away, um, I didn't have an issue with the format that the story was written in, the interview format. I haven't read a lot of stories like that. I don't know if Evelyn Hugo and the Seven Husbands or whatever was written like that. That's just, those were just books that didn't really uh, appeal to me, so I haven't read those. But the story is written uh, pretty much entirely as an interview. These band members reflecting on what happened you know, 40 years ago when they were in the band Daisy Jones and the Six and telling you all this stuff that happened. When you're writing a story like that, the whole show and don't tell rule kind of gets like yeeted out the window. But you know what? I was cool with that. I was fine. It was kind of interesting. And at no point did it being an interview like break the immersion for me. And I think it being an interview actually gave a pretty interesting and unique way of telling the story and specifically perspective. But I'll get to that a bit later. If anything, I think that the format the story was written in actually worked. I think it was done pretty well, so. Wow. Bravo for that. I do want to get my biggest issue with this story out of the way first, and it's it's kind of a big frustration point for me. My biggest issue is that if you weren't shown the cover for Daisy Jones and the Six, and if you weren't told that it was set in the 60s and 70s, you just wouldn't know. You just wouldn't. There was this incredible opportunity, like there is when you tell a story set in, you know, a different decade, there was an incredible opportunity to really weave the culture of the 70s, especially the culture of 70s rock and roll, into the narrative of the story, and I honestly don't feel like that was done. 70s rock and roll is one of the most recognizable and iconic cultural eras, and I just don't see the point in writing a story set within that cultural era if you're not going to include any of it. And no, them being an abandoned liking to do drugs doesn't count that that doesn't make it a 70s story. So the second uh, biggest issue, I'm just going to get out of the way as well. And the whole reason I wanted to read this book is because I saw it being sold, spoken about on BookTube as just being phenomenal. It was this book set, you know, with sex, drugs, rock and roll, about this badass female rock star. And I was like, oh, that's cool. I, w I want to read about a badass female rock star coming up in a time where female rock stars were scarce and weren't generally as respected as their counterparts. I want to read about that. That sounds pretty interesting. And I'm okay with it being inspired by Fleetwood Mac because I was expecting a Stevie Nicks type story or a Pat Benatar type story or a Bonnie Tyler type story. But if I can be honest, Daisy Jones is one of the most unlikable characters I've ever read about. And for the start of the story, I was like, okay, we're going to read about this unlikable character and we're going to see her become a better person through, you know, the events of a drug addiction and the tumultuous rock star lifestyle, all that kind of stuff. I was like, okay, that's that's fine. I'm willing to stick it out for that. But the problem is that by the end of the story, she still kind of sucks. I'm not talking about the Daisy Jones that's giving the interview. I mean, at the end of the actual narrative of the story, before it cuts back to close off with the interview, at the end of the narrative said in the past, there's there's been no kind of reflection or there's been no full circle in her character arc. And if you're sitting there thinking, but Cam, what about Billy? Billy was like the same and yeah, he sucked as well. <laughs> but it's Daisy Jones's face on the front of the book and I think it's pretty understandable that she is 
intended to be the main character. The narrative of the story flip-flops between Daisy Jones' stubbornness as being a bad thing and a good thing. It's either presented to you as an unwillingness to compromise that, you know, pisses off the rest of the band and pisses off the music producers, etc., or it's presented as, a, you know, an empowering thing. She's stubborn, but she gets her way because that's what she deserves and blah, blah, blah. And these moments that I feel like were meant to be like really holy shit, go Daisy Jones moments to me just felt like super obnoxious. I'll give you an example. There's a bit towards the beginning of the story where she's in the music studio and she's recording like her first record or something like that. And there's a music producer there and the music producer asks her to sing in, in a different way because this is what producers do. They make tweaks to songs to make them sound better. And sometimes they might ask you to sing a different way. It doesn't mean they're going to make you do it that way permanently. They just want to try out different things so they can mesh it with the music, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, that's their job. That's what the producer does. And I feel like the producer was pretty polite in how he asked for her to do it, but it turns into this whole thing in the story where the producer is a dickhead because he's trying to tell her how to make her music and blah 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 and it's like he's a producer it didn't need to be like a man versus woman thing it was just weird obviously there's a lot of other instances in the book where sexism is a thing and sexism was a thing in that time so absolutely that should be touched on i just think there were a lot of examples of this that were quite shallow and just kind of dumb. Like I said, the story kind of flip-flops between her being stubborn and uncompromising as being a bad thing and it being an empowering thing. So it's just confusing for the reader at a lot of points as to how women to feel about her wanting to be the alpha dog in every situation. Now, Billy was the same. He had kind of like a side story in itself where it touched on the struggles of temptation with alcohol because he was an alcoholic reformed. Now he's a reformed alcoholic the temptation with Daisy Jones herself and like the love between the two. And that was easily one of the most interesting parts of the story was the struggles of temptation. But Billy too was a control freak and that's a trait you're gonna find in a lot of stories that center around a band because that's usually the biggest dramas of these bands, so that's fine. I'm cool with them having like this Daisy verse, Billy control freak battle that turns into love, whatever. That's fine, I'm cool with that. But like I said before, their character arcs never seem to come full circle. In stories where you have a band or a team or anything like that, and there is a character or characters that like to control the situation, and that's meant to be their flaw or the drama of the story, the idea is that by the end, they have become aware of this and they change their ways. They, tr they transform themselves so that they can be a better person for the band or for the team. Neither Billy or Daisy have any kind of epiphany by the end of the story where they say, you know what, I was kind of shitty to the rest of the band members, maybe I should have let them have a say. There's never a moment like that. And this becomes an even bigger issue when that's meant to be one of the main dramas of the story. Through the whole story we get the perspective from the different band members being interviewed, talking about how Daisy and Billy would control everything. We keep reading and reading about this control freak perspective from the other band members, but ultimately there's no point because it doesn't come to anything. If you want a better example, I have a better example. This, this is one of the things that pissed me off the most, right? So Billy has a brother in the story. His name's Graham. They're the ones that started the band together. Through the whole story, Graham has been very supportive of Billy through everything he's done, through all the, you know, shitty drama that Billy's caused. Graham has been very supportive of him. And every time Graham wants something from Billy, which is just normal brother stuff, like, for example, Graham writes a song, which is something he's never done before, and he kind of wants it to be on their new album. So he brings it to Billy, and Billy's just like, nah. And obviously it's a good song because Graham sells it to another band and it becomes a big hit. But even worse than that, towards the end of the story, Graham is having a breakdown because of... Well, something I'll get into in a bit. Graham's having a breakdown and he comes to his brother for help and Billy says, nah, and fucks off to go have a drink. Now, when I read this, I was like, oh shit, like this has to be like the rock bottom for Billy. This has to be where he realizes how shit he's being and he's going to have this big reunion moment with his brother where they actually have a moment for once in the whole fucking book where it feels like they're actually related to each other or give a shit about each other. But no, that's pretty much the last interaction that those brothers have for the rest of the book. What the fuck was the point of including this whole thing of like Graham needing help from his little brother for the little brother to tell him to piss off and never really notice what a shitty move that was? Is the moral of the story there that, oh, okay, Billy's a dickhead and I guess still a dickhead. 
It's just moments like that. It's like a build up to a moment of reflection for Daisy or Billy that never happens. Another issue I have with the book is that like 90% of the dialogue during the interviews is just a circle jerk of how like great Daisy Jones is, how beautiful she is, how, how great she still looks even when she's splintered on drugs, how amazing her voice is, how amazing her songwriting is, how she's an icon, everyone loves her, she's a fashion trendsetter, just all of this stuff like that, even moments where the band members are talking about negative feelings they have for Daisy Jones, they almost always bounce it right back to how great she is before they even finish their sentence. Now, t to break up the rant with some of the things I liked about Daisy Jones and the Six, I would say that the Graham and Karen side story was fascinating. I, I really loved it. In fact, a large part of me wishes that was the actual story because God knows it was a lot more interesting. Graham and Karen are both members of this band, Daisy Jones and the Six, and they kind of spark up a romance. And this, I wouldn't even call it a drama, but there's this kind of intense relationship between them where Graham is a, quite a romantic guy and he wants to settle down with Karen. He wants the family. He wants all of that stuff. And Karen's quite the opposite. She is more for just having fun. She She's not really at any point in the future looking for a husband or a family or anything like that. And yet we get the read about her struggles with these feelings because she still cares so deeply about Graham. Perhaps she even loves him, but it's just not what she wants. All that kind of comes to a head when she finds out that she's pregnant. And then her and Graham have to go through this situation where Karen obviously seeks out abortion and that essentially breaks Graham's heart, as as it would if you found out the woman you love was pregnant, and then you find out she doesn't feel the same way about you, she doesn't want a family. Graham kind of watches all of this stuff like crumble right before his eyes. That's the moment when he goes to his brother for help, and that turned out great. Now back to a problem I have with this book, addiction is a weird, weird plot device in this one. But I don't want to be harsh, but I feel like the whole drug addiction saga in this story was entirely included just to remind you that this book is meant to be set in the 70s. I just can't get behind including something as serious as a drug addiction and to the point of it being a rehab thing if it's just going to be glossed over at every turn. Through the whole book, Daisy's popping a lot of pills, she's always munted off her face, but at no point do we ever get any kind of explanation into the root of this, or how she genuinely feels about her addiction. We never get some kind of recovery segment, which again would have been good for completing her character arc. We come extremely close at one point towards the end of the story where she's talking about how she wants to recover, goes so far as to say she'll go to rehab, and then that's pretty much negated within literally one page. I think it's like glossed over again a bit later in the interview about her recovering from the drugs, but it's just, there was just no point in drugs being included in this. It would have been fantastic to read about this band where you have two extremely talented people kind of going head to head constantly because they're so creatively powerful and then they end up falling in love. That sounds like a great story. The story sounds even better when you include the fact that both of these people, one of which is a reformed alcoholic who obviously struggled with addiction and the other is in the midst of an addiction. I think that could have been a really good bonding moment for Daisy and Billy is diving deep into the subject of addiction, especially in that time and in that culture where being addicted to drugs was so romanticized and seeing Billy try to help Daisy through the addiction without you know, falling to temptation of his own addictions, his own love for her, that would have been great. That would have been a fantastic story. But yeah, drug addiction in, in Daisy Jones and the Six is literally just an accessory to the plot. Another thing I liked about Daisy Jones and the Six though is that the interview format. I mentioned before the perspective was something I really enjoyed. Sometimes the story would do this thing where you have uh, two members of the band giving their interview, and they would be describing the exact same event, I guess. And because you're being told the same event from two different people, you get two entirely different perspectives. And I think that was super interesting. Just as an easy example, there was one scene where Karen confronts Daisy about her being an addict, and Daisy like takes her pill and just throws it away like it's nothing. Karen in the interview says that she was surprised about how easy it was for Daisy to just throw it away. And then it cuts to Daisy giving her side of the story, saying that it was one of the hardest things she ever had to do. I think that was just, that was really interesting, and I think that is the beauty of writing in this format. I think that is the exact benefit and purpose of writing in an interview format. There were so many, like, weird, 
cringy bits of dialogue that were like, they were written like Taylor Jenkins Reid wanted them to be quotes that people would get tattooed on their arms after reading the book. It was just, I don't know, it just kind of felt like 2009 Tumblr quotes at certain points. Like they were meant to be powerful, but really all they did was just <laughs> farted clouds of obnoxious into the air. There was a bit about her not wanting to be someone's muse because she's her own creative person. Like those two things are counter to each other when they're not. And that's just, it's just kind of dumb. Being someone's muse doesn't mean they respect you any less or don't think you're capable of being creative yourself. It just means they adore you or they're, they're fascinated by you to the point where it gives them inspiration. That's literally it. it. It's not counter to you being creative. It's just stuff like that. It was just really kind of dumb, faux, woke kind of stuff, I don't know. I did really enjoy the way that the songwriting in the book was weaved into the narrative and weaved into the, like, emotional turmoils. Specifically the Daisy Jones and Billy relationship, because they were the two songwriters of the band. Their songwriting had a pretty huge impact on their relationship at certain points in the story, and I liked that. I thought that was really cool. The bits of the story that focused more on the music were the more enjoyable. Who would have guessed? <laughs> <laughs> Look, I don't mean to be harsh or anything, but like I said in my Outsiders review, I just think if you stripped away all of the aesthetic of this being like 70s baby, it's just like, I don't think people would have enjoyed it as much. I mean, what even was the ending of this book? Like, what the fuck? The whole idea is that it was meant to be a series of interviews building up to a climax. How did the band end in Chicago on that fateful night? How did the big split happen? But it wasn't like one big thing happened that split up the band like you're hoping for. It's just like everyone just kind of quit. Like it just fizzled out. You're hoping for an explosion, but what you get is like someone filling their mouth with water and just going. I mean, if I'm going to rate any book one star, I guess it, it's going to be Daisy Jones and the Six. I give it one star. I just don't think it was a good book. I just think it was bad. It was a bad book. And God damn it. I'm not doing another video book review until I have a book that I like. I don't want people to start thinking that I am like a super negative person when it comes to books because if anything, I tend to rate books more positively than most people I know. It just so happens that the last few have been kind of stinkers. If I was to summarize, if you took all of the most boring parts from different band biography books and like, wow, 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 squished them together, you would have Daisy Jones and the Six. As always, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Catch ya.